He was Knight Rider, she was Lady Sundown. Judy and Alvin Neely drove around in separate cars using CB radios, searching for girls to snatch and violate, updating each other on their progress with their code names. What they did to their victims is the stuff of nightmares, because real outlaws don't leave witnesses. Welcome to True Crime Recaps, I'm Chris. The clock on their freedom started counting down when Judith Neely asked John Hancock and his fiancée Janice K. Chapman for directions. Judy floated the name of a country road near Rome, Georgia, then pretended not to understand the directions the couple gave her. She was new in town, she said, didn't know a soul. Couldn't they maybe jump in her car and show her the way? And that's how John and Janice met Judy's husband, Alvin Neely. One of them wouldn't survive the introduction. In 1982, when our story takes place, Judy Neely is an 18-year-old mom of twins. You wouldn't expect her to be a stone-cold killer, but that's exactly what she was counting on. After John Hancock and Janice K. Chapman agree to take a ride with her, Judy hops on her CB radio to a man she calls Knight Rider. I've got a couple of new friends with me, she says. We should all meet up. I think you'll like them. Alvin Neely is very sure he will like her new friends. He always likes the people his young wife brings him. Alvin was a 26-year-old two-bit thief when he met Judy. She she was only 15, and he was already married, but neither one of them saw any reason to hit the brakes on their unfolding love affair. Alvin quickly dumped his first wife, then he and his teenage bride eloped in 1980. The names on their marriage certificates might as well have been Bonnie and Clyde, if those infamous outlaws were also twisted sexual deviants. Fast forward two years to October 4th, 1982, when Alvin pulls up alongside Judy's car with their twin toddlers in tow. He's trying hard to make it seem like everything's just fine, but in reality, the trap is closing around John and Janice. Alvin suggests they split up, John with him and the twins, Janice with Judy. They drove down the Georgia back roads heading for a fake party when John asks Alvin to pull over so he can go to the bathroom. But just as John's finishing up his business, he hears footsteps behind him. It's Judy, and she's packing heat. The last thing she says before pulling the trigger is, I'll take care of Janice too. John's quick thinking saved his life. He took half a step to the left at the last second and the bullet missed his major organs. Sadly, he couldn't save his 23-year-old girlfriend from the Neelys. He lay on the side of the country road, hoping someone would spot him and get help. Meanwhile, Janice is enduring another level of hell. Just across the state line in Alabama, in the Neelys' seedy motel room, Janice is being violated, tortured, and beaten. When they finish with her, Judy shoots Janice once in the back, but she doesn't die. So Alvin picks her up and holds her against a tree so Judy can shoot her again, this time at point-blank range to the chest. Janice isn't their first victim, and she would not have been their last, but thankfully, dumb luck intervened. A passing truck driver rescued John, and the hospital managed to remove the bullet. He's back on his feet at the police station the very next day. He's sitting on a bench, waiting to talk to a detective when he hears a recording of Judy Neely's voice. The sound leads him to a room filled with cops in the middle of investigating another case. That's her, John says. That's the woman who abducted me. Talk about a lucky coincidence. The police were puzzling over a series of anonymous calls about a body. In the span of 24 hours, a woman had called two police precincts and a radio station to say she left the body of a 13-year-old girl at the bottom of a canyon. Thanks to John, now they knew the tipster was Judith Neely. On September 25th, 1982, a little over a week before her path crossed with John and Janice's, Judy spotted 13-year-old Lisa Miller at the Riverbend Mall in Rome, Georgia. Lisa was at the mall with a group of girls from a children's home where she lived. The home was a holding place for troubled girls, so everyone thought Lisa just ran away. But as the days went by and she didn't pop up in any of her usual spots, hope began to fade. Somehow, Judy convinced Lisa to leave with her. She took her back to the motel in Alabama where Alvin and the twins were waiting. Yes, the twins, who were two years old at the time, were there while Lisa's nightmare unfolded. Over the next few days, Judy and Alvin sexually assaulted and tortured the 13-year-old. She was forced to sleep naked on the floor chained to the bed. Then one morning, while Alvin and the twins went to breakfast, Judy hustled Lisa into the car and drove her out to Little River Canyon. It was a lonely, desolate spot where locals sometimes dumped their garbage. Judy marched the child over to a tree and told her she was going to give her a shot to make her sleep so she could leave without her knowing where she was going. Now that probably sounded pretty good to Lisa, so she laid 
down on the ground, but there would be no mercy coming her way. As the story goes, Alvin once heard that injecting someone with Drano was a fast and easy way to kill a person. Just to be on the safe side, the Neelys also picked up some liquid plumber in case the Drano didn't work. While Lisa lay there waiting to go to sleep and end this, Judy stuck a needle filled with Drano in her neck and stood back to watch what happened. They were both disappointed. The injection burned, but Lisa didn't go to sleep and she didn't die. So Judy filled another needle with liquid plumber and injected her again. Still nothing. For the next 30 minutes, she stuck her again and again, six times in Lisa's neck, arms, and butt cheeks, but the girl wouldn't die. Judy was running out of patience. She forced Lisa to the edge of the canyon where she shot her in the back, hoping she'd tumble off the cliff, but the 13-year-old fell backwards instead, so Judy knelt down and pushed the girl's body over the edge with her knee, but now she had blood on her jeans, so she took them off and threw them over the 80-foot drop where they landed near her victim. The used syringes went over the side with them. It's hard to understand why she alerted police about the girl's body, probably because no one was looking for Lisa. Judy liked the idea of being a notorious outlaw, but it's hard to build your brand when no one knows what you're doing. She didn't count on another one of her victims overhearing her and alerting police. John Hancock described the Neely's cars to police, which got them arrested 12 days later in Tennessee. Maybe I should say got them arrested again, because the Neely's were already in prison for passing bad checks when the Alabama police caught up to them for murder. Judith was questioned first. Detectives figured she'd be the weakest link, but she was actually the mastermind. Forensic psychologist Michael Stone came up with a 22-point scale for evil. The lowest levels are your crime of passion killings. The mid-level is reserved for psychopaths you can see coming, your foaming-at-the-mouth type of monsters. But the top level are the worst of the worst. Killers like Ted Bundy, who had have the smarts and the skills to convince you they're not evil. According to him, that's Judith Neely. Violence turned her on. Watching Alvin violate the victims she brought him was her thing. As for Alvin, psychologists say he had the low IQ and bloodlust to make him easily manipulated. When they first got together, they started slowly. Alvin showed her how to rob convenience stores, and she took to the outlaw life fast. But the thrill faded just as fast, so she started taking bigger and bigger risks. In the fall of 1980, when Judy was nine months pregnant with the twins, she robbed a woman at gunpoint with Alvin's help. They immediately got themselves arrested trying to cash the woman's check. Two days later, Judy gave birth. While she was being held in juvenile detention, she wrote letters to Alvin's prison, telling him she was being sexually assaulted by the staff. Whether she was or wasn't is unclear, but as far as Alvin was concerned, her word was gospel. She got out in 1981. He was released in 1980. Together, they formulated a plan for revenge. On September 11th, they shot up Ken Dooley's house. Ken was a security guard at the detention center. The next night, they threw a Molotov cocktail onto another employee's driveway, Linda Adair. No one was hurt, but an anonymous caller promised Linda, you both will die before the night's over. The same caller phoned the sheriff's office. For the abuse I took, they are both going to die. Two weeks later, the caller, Judy Neely, moved on to another other target, Lisa Milliken. When the police finally caught up to them in mid-October, Alvin drew them a map to Janice Chapman's body. The Neely twins went to live with Alvin's mother, but they maintained a relationship with their parents. Alvin had pled guilty to the kidnap and murder of Janice Chapman in exchange for taking the death penalty off the table. He died in prison in 2005. Judy almost happily confessed to everything, including the death of Lisa Milliken. Detectives got the impression she was bragging, but at trial, she un veiled a sweet, shy version of herself. She claimed it was all Alvin's doing, and in fact, she was her husband's third victim. She put on quite a show, complete with fake tears, but when the prosecutor asked the court to make her lift her face out of her hands, the jury saw it was all an act. There were no tears, no real emotion. It was just another one of her traps. The jury gave her life without parole. The judge thought that was too lenient. He gave her death. At 18, she was the youngest woman on death row in Alabama, but the governor at the time bizarrely commuted her sentence to life with parole. Every so often, she comes up in front of the parole board to ask for her freedom. So far, she hasn't gotten it. This is a woman who kept lists of people she didn't like, vowed revenge on people. Her intelligence and anger easily make her one of the most dangerous women behind bars. Let's hope she stays there. 
And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.